Good evening. And thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Brenda Aiken, Barnard College class of 1977, BPNS class of 1981. And I am delighted to be moderating this event tonight. She opened the door, Health and Justice Initiative, Lessons Learned from the Pandemic, which is part of the Columbia Alumni Association's weekly Columbia at Home virtual series, which features Colombian speakers on informative and engaging topics during this very difficult time. Diverse topics span the latest on COVID-19 crisis, health and wellness, entertainment, and more. The She Opened the Door initiative, which began with a historic conference in New York City in 2018, aims to enlighten, educate, elevate, and to empower Columbia women across the university. She Opened the Door forces this powerful network of women whose connection with Columbia broadens their potential and impact in the world, both personally and professionally. Now, a year into this pandemic, issues of health inequities, disparities, and injustice have come to the forefront in the public consciousness. Columbia alumni and faculty who are passionate about these issues have been leading the drive to expose these failures and to improve healthcare for everyone in our communities. Today, I have the pleasure of exploring with two talented panelists an alumnus and faculty member, the unmasking of America and the interconnectedness of racial and social injustices and in health inequities and how it informs healthcare and the work ahead in the communities that we work and live in. This discussion is an active Q&A format. Panelists will answer curated questions from me and those sent to you at the registration or that you sent at the registration. And we hope we can get to all of them, but there were many. You are being, re being recorded and a video of this webinar will be made available at a later date. I first have the pleasure of introducing Professor Courtney Cogburn. Dr. Cogburn is an associate professor of the Columbia University School of Social Work and a faculty at the Columbia Population Research Center and Data Science Institute, where she co-chairs with the Computational Social Science Working Group. She employs a transdisciplinary research strategy to improve the characterization and measurement of racism and in examining the role of racism in the production of racial inequities in health. She is also a member of the AMA External Equity and Innovation Advisory Group. Dr. Cogburn's work also explores the potential of media and technology in creating and eradicating racism and racial inequities in healthcare. She's a lead creator of the 1000 Cut Journey, an immersive virtual reality racism experience that was developed in collaboration with the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University and premiered in Tribeca Film Festival in 2018. She received her PhD in education and psychology and an MSW from the University of Michigan and a BA from the psychology in psychology from the University of Virginia. Welcome, Dr. Cogburn. Thank you. Our second panelist is Dr. Julia Iyashura. She is the executive director of the Dalio Center of Health Justice at New York Presbyterian. A native of California, Dr. Iyashura is a graduate of Yale University, joined Columbia Community at the Vagelos College Co Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, pursuing a dual degree with the business school and graduating with an MD and MBA in 2008. After completing her residency in internal medicine at Columbia and a year as, as a chief resident, she joined the Depart Division of General Medicine and completed a part-time fellowship in medical stimulation at New York Presbyterian. 
Simulation Center. She also served as the director of the Lead Academy of Physician Leadership and Career Development Program. And she served as the associate director for the G graduate medical education and associate program director of Columbia's internal medicine residency program. Welcome, Dr. Julia Iyashura. I'm going to start first with a question to Dr. Julia Iyashura. Can you tell me, tell all of us more about the Dalio Center and the vaccine supply chain? Sure, uh, and I will try to keep this um, at least down to 10 minutes. I'm kidding, I'll, I'll make it shorter than that. Uh, the Dahlia Center for Health Justice at New York Presbyterian is um, inaugurated in October of last year with an incredible gift from the Dahlia Foundation and Ray Dahlia. And our overarching mission is the identification and elimination of health disparities. That's a broad topic. So we were then really left to understand and underscore where would we be working and what, what is important for us to engage in. So, um, you know, the Dalio Center and I refer people to our website, which has a lot of our information of what we're doing and who we are. Um, but, you know, I think a short answer is to say that as we think about that sort of trifecta of education, clinical care and research, we've also adopted those three pillars. We've added, however, um, a, an underscoring of data and infrastructure because understanding and identifying gaps in care is really hinges on excellent data to begin with. So we've launched a number of initiatives through the Dalio Center, both in terms of you know, trust and, and developing relationships with our patients around demographic data. We've developed new programs within the hospital. We've started to look at health equity metrics across the enterprise. So the work we're doing is quite broad. Um, to really tie it into uh, vaccination and the work we're doing in vaccination, though, I think really um, highlights all of the different pillars that we have in the center. The first is data. So it was quite important to everyone at New York Presbyterian that we understood who we were vaccinating and we wanted to ensure that the vaccines that we had were reaching our most vulnerable populations. So um, I worked with, and I should say we worked, there's a huge number of people behind all of this. Mm -hmm. um, we worked to ensure that we were collecting race and ethnicity data for the patients that we vaccinate. We are un, you know, collecting also location data. Where are our patients coming from? Are we serving our vulnerable populations? I just looked at some of this data um, about 24 hours ago uh, and we vaccinated over 100,000 patients at the armory site at 168th Street. Uh, over 50% of them identify as Hispanic or Latinx. I think it was about 13 to, to maybe 12, 12 to 13% identified as Black or African American. And an overwhelming majority of these patients came from the catchment area that we had really designated. So looking at Harlem, Inwood, Washington Heights, and South Bronx, because we wanted to ensure that again, we were, that we were using the vaccines that we had to reach our target population. When we start to think about the other aspects of uh, the work that's necessary though, to engage such a large community, it really is, um, such an amazing partnership between government and community affairs, our teams in communications, our ambulatory care network. They set up call centers. They engaged with over 70 community-based organizations. And we developed a vaccine education center with a speakers bureau of over 60 physicians and clinicians at, from Columbia and Cornell who go out to give talks to the community. I myself have done a fair number of them. Um, I actually had one scheduled for tomorrow, but I think we've rescheduled just so that we can get a little bit more information about J&J &J before we host an event. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually, I'll, and I'll give you some really up-to-date information on how important these are. Um, I just learned this afternoon and it brought me to tears actually that a talk that I had given to a um, faith-based organization to a church in Brooklyn, um, predominantly black church, I think over about 200 people tuned in to the talk. I stayed around for a long time to answer as many questions as I could. 
And I was just told today that they cited that talk, which I actually gave in February, as one of the reasons they became a vaccine center, a vaccine hub. So, you know, I think, and I honestly, I cried this afternoon <laughs> hearing about that. It was, it was just so heartwarming. But, you know, I think when we think about the work of the Dalio Center, it is to help identify gaps in care and to help narrow those gaps in care. And that is through multiple different pillars and arms, but it is always and always in collaboration, in partnership with not only our university partners, our partners within the hospital, and then always with our community. So, um, you know, I think the vaccine supply chain, we don't necessarily have control over the supply chain because that comes from the, the federal government, mm -hmm. um, but we do have control over equitable, equitable distribution. And I think a lot of work was done to make sure that it was reaching target populations. No, thank you. And thank you for that, you know, answer. Um, I'm going to ask a few more questions about the community because often we think about um, what we could do for the community, but part of this pandemic is, is really revealing how much we have to embrace and work within the community to be a part of the solution. So Dr. Cogburn, can you, t you know, Martin Luther King had the quote, his famous quote about health, we have all the inequities, you know, all of the um, forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Can you talk a little bit more about um, racism and how the it affects the, con the conditions and the people of color and how this sort of manifests itself now? And where do we go from here? Yeah, I think what's so what's so striking about you know racial inequities in health is just how they're rooted in so many different facets of society. Um, it's not only uh, behavior, right? Choices I make about what I eat or how I move my body. Um, it's really rooted in everything about society. So housing, education, uh, quality of neighborhoods, um, access to care. Um, et cetera. And I think that just raises um, possibilities and challenges. It, it, it introduces a complex web of issues that we're trying to address when we're thinking about social determinants of, of health and something that's actually quite distal from the health outcome itself can be driving uh, these, these inequities um, in, in health. And I think that's part of what presents such an amazing challenge for people working in this space. Um, but the opportunities there are, these are things that can be addressed and changed. There's nothing inherent in the bodies of black people, uh, for instance, that suggests that we should have a higher rate of heart disease or, or stroke. Uh, when we're able to identify these uh, social factors that contribute to those outcomes, uh, we actually have something we can uh, identify to intervene upon and do something about. Um, and I think that's what's so important about understanding these inequities in health. And we were talking about this in our, in our prep call that if we actually want to stand a chance of doing something about these inequities, we have to be broad and nuanced about how we think these problems actually manifest. And, you know, in the early days of COVID, right, and people talking about the, the disparate rates of infection, uh, so many people went immediately to behavior that this group must not be social distancing, this group must not be wearing their mask until you know health disparities, health inequity um, work uh, researchers and scholars and practitioners came onto the scene and said, maybe people have living conditions that are not suitable for distancing. Maybe this group is more likely to be uh, working in roles that are considered essential and have to travel and complicated the, the narrative, which, which actually bears out in the data in terms of who was at greater risk. Um, so I think that framing is, is quite critical uh, for, for all of us to understand uh, and not to sort of um, default to assumptions that lay blame on particular bodies and start thinking about social contexts that produce these inequities in health. Actually, I just want to say I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think so easily and quickly we can lay blame at the individual level and we can say it's this person's fault that they you know, didn't follow up or this person's fault that they have a medical condition that could have been treated or you know, whatever that is. 
but it's really, I think, our responsibility. And I think when I say our, I think it's everyone's responsibility mm-hmm. in this country to really be curious and investigate and think a couple of steps upstream and really understand what's the system at play that led to that outcome. Because you are very, you're so right that, you know, when we look at public policies and we look at the effects of them over time, you may just see that tip of the iceberg of someone coming to an office appointment with, you know, hypertension. But what you're not seeing are the, you know, 50, 60 years of underinvestment into the community of inability to, you know, access the job market in a meaningful way of the systemic racism in our country that really doesn't allow people the same opportunities and then what we're, but what we're seeing at the end of the road is perhaps a healthcare outcome. And so I think it's so important and the work that Dr. Cogburn is doing is so important at really un, like unmasking all of those layers and getting back to what's really the root cause. Because if we're just patching the end, yeah. we're just gonna continue to have that. But if we're fixing the original problem, if we're ensuring that everyone has equitable access, that everyone has, you know, equitable opportunities, then maybe we won't have to patch the end anymore. Maybe mm-hmm, then yeah. that problem won't actually exist. So, you know, I'm, I already said this in our prep session, but I'm <laughs> extremely honored and excited to share the stage. Oh, you too. Thank you. Yeah. Because I love the work she's doing and it really just, it get, I, I apologize, it like really gets me going. I get really excited <laughs> when Thank I start you. Thinking yeah. about the work she does. So, yeah. Sorry for cutting it though. No, no, no I think that's Absolutely. great. And can you talk, um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about your work in terms of um, how do, you know, it took this pandemic, you know, to really, the uh, we mask and the unmasking, we see this is all revealed to us. It took this pandemic to do it, but it already existed. How do we get that, you know, the world, our, our country first, just mobilized to really focus and pay attention to this now, that this is something that requires our eye on it. And and never more should we let this happen again. Yeah, I mean, I think one, one of the most important things for people who are just sort of coming to this realization of uh, where we live and just how deep uh, these uh, inequities uh, go in, in our society is you know, question yourself about why you didn't see it before. Why didn't you notice? Uh, why weren't you paying attention and why weren't you engaged? And I'm happy, I, I am grateful that we are having these conversations, um, you know, outside of the realm of people who study, you know, health disparities. Uh, because we, like, like uh, Julia said, we all have a responsibility for doing something about this and the spheres that influence health are all the spheres of society, right? So we all need to be thinking about health, health equity and how we can um, achieve it. Um, mm-hmm. And part of my work is, is around that, is around framing. Are we all talking about the same problem? And um, if we aren't talking about the same problem, we are going to be addressing different problems. Um, so if we think differences in health by race are a problem of the racial group or our problem of individual bodies. We will attempt to fix individual bodies. We will attempt to fix racial groups and we won't attempt to fix systems in social contexts that help produce those outcomes. So the framing of understanding, um, you know, my some of my colleagues call it structural competence, like a competency around how this works and how we got here is really critical. And anytime we notice or observe a racial pattern in society, we either default to some assumption that there's something inherent in that group that got them there, be it an advantage or disadvantage, right? So you have language of um, white supremacy, right? So white people are better off because they're better, because they're inherently better. Or do we wanna take a more sophisticated view and say, maybe there's something else that's contributing to this pattern around this social construct that we made up that doesn't really exist as something that would produce those kinds of patterns. Race doesn't exist in a function that would actually produce patterns like this. What else is giving us those patterns? What else are producing those patterns? And the more of us that have that grounding and understanding, you know, goes back to Julia's point, we start engaging in a different way. We start analyzing the problem differently. We start identifying different points of, of intervention, but inevitably, 
we can, in spite of like decades and decades of research documenting, you know, how much a zip code can produce your, you know, predict your life expectancy, we go back to well, what did you do? What choice did you make as an individual that's producing this outcome? So a lot of my work is focused on getting more people to, to understand, which includes the work in, in virtual reality. Do you see these patterns? Do you understand um, some of these patterns? And moving beyond thinking about racism as something that's individual or interpersonal that gets exchanged between people, which it absolutely is, it also functions in our policies. It functions in how systems are set up. It functions in cultural norms and ideologies and narratives. Uh, and it's important for us to understand all of that and address all of that. So both of you are leading educators for the next generation that's coming, you know, at the university here in Morningside campus and also at the medical center and for the next group of doctors and scientists that are coming along, social scientists and, you know, so, and medical scientists. Um, what should that look like, their curricula look like moving ahead in the future so that we get them to begin to think, I'll start Julia with you because I know that you did the stimulation lab and you did many other things before you, you know, started directing the uh, Dalio Center. Absolutely. Um, you know, medical education is where I started. Uh, and actually, you know, if we start to think about, uh, sometimes we think about like, why do we do the things that we do? What are those patterns that are set in time? Mm -hmm. Both of my parents were English professors. So the idea of um, education as a way through or a way up or a way to explain, a way to engage has always been something that's been part of my career. Um, and so I think with medical education, it is so important that we uncover all of the aspects of systemic racism which have led to the health outcomes that we see. We shouldn't live in a world where in, I believe it was 2016, don't quote me on that, but I believe it was, it was definitely within the last 10 years mm -hmm. that when they surveyed medical students um, mm -hmm. at a leading institution, they said that they thought that the skin of black patients was thicker, that they thought that black patients did not experience pain in the same way. Mm -hmm. This is within the last decade that people believe these things. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to start educating in a different way. We have to approach the problem and the system in a different way, because clearly if we're getting people that are still believing that in the 20th century, then we've got some work to do. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we've done objectively, um, you know, within my own purview and in, within the Dalio Center, we actually have two fellowship programs uh, and we will be expanding that in the mm -hmm. near future. Um, but one of them is a physician development program. You mentioned it earlier called Lead Academy. And after really thinking about, well, how do we educate and train the future physician leaders, what, what's necessary to their education, it was really important for our, my entire organization. And this is from the top CEO level down. It was incredibly important that they understood health equity, that they understood health justice, and that that is not just over there that that's part of what you do as a, as a clinician physician leader is understand the health disparities, understand the health inequities and always be striving to improve them. So all of the work that they do is aligned in the Dalio Center. So I you know, assign projects, capstone projects that they work on and all of these are rather large institutional projects that really get to the heart of some of the inequities. Um, whether or not it's in clinical care, whether or not it's an expansion of programming, whether or not it's how we think about education. So um, I think we have training and education of our current physician clinician groups. Mm -hmm. Within graduate medical education, there's a wealth of opportunity. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a ton of work being done both at Columbia and Cornell in health equity fellowships, in educating and training our graduate staff. I was just involved in a session two days ago, thinking about uh, you know new curricula for some of the graduate staff around you know anti-racism, around allyship, and and I think then that just feeds back. That goes back to the medical school as we think about how do you create a line, a thorough like a through line through all of the work, so that it's not that you're thinking about health equity as a separate construct. You're thinking about it as you're learning everything within medicine. 
Mm -hmm. understanding how it underscores everything that we see and how it really requires systemic changes so that we can see differential health outcomes. But I, I mean, I'm not going to limit that to medical education. I well, think that all that's of a nice segue actually to Dr. <laughs> Comfort. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as you think about here, the overlap now, we can see now the weaving of medicine and social science together. Can you talk about, um, again, for the, the next generation of, of students coming through, you know, the School of Social Work, through, um, through the undergraduate campus, uh, through the, you know, gra college graduate, uh, getting college graduate degrees, what is that going to look like if we're going to address these issues in the future? Oh man, you know, I think we need a whole complete overhaul. Let's just start, let's start over. I mean, honestly, we have been as a nation woefully under and miseducated about the, the legacy of racial oppression in this country. Like most of us do not really understand. Um, and in some ways that was a deliberate, right? That's the deliberate miseducation that keeps us in this cycle. Mm -hmm. um, too many of us, uh, you know, grown people with graduate degrees, uh, you know, have never read the work of a black author or have never, you know, done a deep study of, uh, you know, American slavery uh, in, in, in transatlantic slave trade, like how that contributes to where we are today and mm -hmm. how it's the foundation of our economic system and how we haven't changed anything. We just kind of held on to, to those, some of those same systems. So I think we all need um, an expanded view of uh, who we've been historically, but, but perhaps even more uh, salient for me is sort of how does that translate into right now and what we think and what we believe and how we practice. So much of what we've inherited uh, in science, in the humanities, in language and cultural practices, et cetera, are rooted in this notion that white people should be centered they are invisibly guiding the ways in which we think uh, this knowledge is important. This is what knowledge means. This is what being a learned person means. Mm -hmm. um, it has shaped invisibly so much of who we are that we have to take a step back and, mm -hmm. and really evaluate this. Um, and, and as Julia said, this is not an add-on. This is not the one class that we can add to the list of things that, that people have to do. For instance, Columbia has to think about its core curriculum. What do we consider core? Whose knowledge is core? Whose names are on our building that we laud as being uh, the most important people who have contributed to society? It, that says something when it's all white men or it's this Eurocentric uh, view of, of knowledge that matters. Um, so it, I would say at every level, um, you know, at the, at the Columbia School of Social Work, we, uh, myself and a, a team of people, including students and alum, help design this new course that centers anti-Black racism as it relates to social work practice. And it's now a, a foundations course for our students coming in. Okay. And it became clear very quickly that we can't train our students and not retrain our staff and faculty. They're gonna know more than we know, right? And so we, we have to think about how do we, all of us think about this, this work. Um, and certainly I hope we're beyond the point where we think good intentions of being a good person and thinking that racism is just terrible is anywhere near sufficient for meaningful change, for you even knowing what's possible for what we could do, for you even knowing and being able to articulate not only what equity is, but how would we actually get there? Um, so I would say we all, self-included, right? I'm, gr I'm growing and learning and reading. And we were talking about in our prep session, like I'm trying to keep up with the latest and greatest thinking in this space as well. Uh, we all have work to do. We all have a, a re-education that's necessary. And it, it certainly sounds like from the programs that the two of you are involved in that, that we're starting to do that work now and that we have the ear and the eyes of other people to, to, um, to make that happen. Um, so, you know, can you elaborate a little bit on the future then? I mean, you, you did talk a little bit about some of those programs, but what, what do you see for 2022? Forget June or May. <laughs> no. that's, a, that's a big ask, Brenda. Um, I think, you know, as I, I expressed this frustration in our prep call, and I hope this is something we're moving beyond, but I've spent too much of my career, um, I don't know uh, how much this has been a part of your career, Julia, but I've spent too much of my career trying to convince people that racism matters. And 
my hope is that we're off that particular hamster wheel and are moving toward understanding uh, and grounding ourselves in existing knowledge around exactly how it does matter so that we can actually get to the work of doing something about it. Um, and in fact, when, when I do these sorts of engagements, I've sort of started with, I'm not talking to the people who don't believe racism exists. Like I can't start the conversation there. I, I want to speak with people and work with people who believe this exists and believes we should do something about it so we can move on. And I hope the future holds some parallel process of grounding us in the realities of our history, of contemporary manifestations of racism and the real work of just being who we say we actually want to be oftentimes, right? This, this notion of freedom and democracy fundamentally hinges on our ability to grapple with racism and how it functions in our society. We will not achieve it without um, addressing, addressing this. So I hope we're moving into a space of redesign and reimagining um, uh, and thinking bigger and more boldly about who we can actually be. Okay. I have to, I mean, that is a, Brenda, that's a really tough question. It um, is, yeah. <laughs> um, what do I see? For it's a tough time for us, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, it's really hard sometimes for me within medicine not to go right back and say the Institute of Medicine probably 20 years ago identified mm -hmm. bias and racism in healthcare and said this is a public health emergency. Right. Um, and yet about 20 years later, we're still talking still about the same issue of systemic racism and bias in the system. And, you know, I think that sometimes I'll be honest, is disheartening to mm -hmm. know that we're still having a lot of those same conversations. But then I think about, okay, well, what's different? And is that, is the difference now enough to really make, make meaningful change? And the one thing that I'll say that, you know, as a, a personally, I get to just hold, I hold space every day thinking about this mm -hmm. is what I do. So do I think that 20 years ago, we would have a center in the hospital dedicated to health justice. Right. 20 years ago, probably not. Yeah. And yet this is an organizational imperative. This is part of New York Presbyterian. And it's been, it's been there, it took years of work with, you know, the, the work they were doing around culture and the culture of respect and our respect credo to really build the sort of the necessary foundation and the structure to have something like the Dalio Center. So it, it wasn't that it was just like, okay, overnight they decided to do this. No, this was a lot of really dedicated concerted efforts to think about how we prepared an organization to be the, the sort of the central hub to have this. It's, you know, thinking about the wonderful community programs that we already run at the hospital and the ones that are expanding. It's thinking about all the work that people are doing day in and day out on the ground to really engage the community and think about our patients and think about patient care. And so that I feel like that's a major difference. That is a yeah. big stamp on, and, and even calling our center the Center for Health Justice. Yes. We went back and forth about that for a little while. And um, and I can tell you now that it's, I've seen it in other places. I'm not gonna name where, but there's a large organization that just also announced a Center for Health Justice. And I got to say we were about six months ahead of them. Sure. Um, but I think even using that terminology was yeah. quite important. And it was mm -hmm. saying that, you know, we really are focused on understanding structural issues, systemic factors. We are dedicated to making the healthcare system just. And that's a little bit different than it saying, is. we're just going to look at health inequities or we'll research it. Or it's, it's saying that we are putting ourselves out there to say, how do you really fix the system? Okay. So I do think that things are different. Um, you know, I, I get to look at what I do as, as emblematic of that difference. Mm -hmm. And I also get to work with phenomenal people every single day that are dedicated to this work. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that when my appointment for the Dalio Center was announced, I got, I think, 200 emails that day wow. of people from across 
our organization from Columbia, from Cornell, and from New York Presbyterian, all saying, congratulations, we are so excited for this. We, what can we do to help make this successful? Right. And I think that's where I say there is a difference. There is a really key, yeah. there's a future for this work is because it was that last piece. What can I do? How mm -hmm. can I be part of this change? Right. What do I need to do? I will put in the work. And so I, you know, I still get, you know, <laughs> it's, it's become a little bit of a challenge to keep up in my inbox. I try. Save them. I have lots of flags on my emails. Yes. But I think about, you know, it's in that name. It's in the, it's calling ourselves. This is a New York Presbyterian Dollar Center for Health Justice. It's the yeah. dedication that we have from our organization from top down. It's the partnerships with Columbia and Cornell. Um, I think that is a meaningful difference. That is yeah. something where I can hold on to and say, we will make a difference. We will see change. And I think, you know, can I put a, can I pinpoint what's going to be different in 2022? Yeah. I mean, look, if you go to our website, there's a lot of programs which we're launching and I'm going to say, I mean, I will make sure many of those are successful. So those will be some clear outcomes, okay. but I think just in sort of larger terms, there's a growing appreciation for the importance of the, of the work, for the study, for the language. And I think that's different. I didn't see that 10 years ago. I definitely didn't see that 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see now. Um, and I, I've been in, at the institution long enough that I didn't think I would ever see it in my, life, my work lifetime, let alone my lifetime. So I'm very happy to see the work that both of you are doing. Both of you have mentioned community a number of times. And I think I started out by saying that, um, you know, it's one thing to sort of look from the, the outside in and saying, you know, you must do, you must do, this is what the community needs. How do you work in part getting the community, community base participating or in your approaches to addressing and in these problems, sort of empowering the community? You know, the vaccine is a case in point. Um, you can say we got the vaccines, folks don't want to get them. Um, but how do you, you sort of alluded to that, but if you can speak about how you gauge community participation, community engagement, and how do you get community not just going to them, but how do you really get them to be a part of the work that you do and informs the work so they feel like this really has value from the community. Um, yeah, I don't know, Courtney, Julia, who wants to take a stab? No, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab and I can say that um, I'm quite lucky that I work at, I mean, the organization that I work for, so New York Presbyterian, um, has been part of the community for decades. Mm -hmm. We have a phenomenal arm, so our, our government and community affairs team um, is really, the, the goal of that is community engagement at all levels. So we have a number of community boards, of liaisons, of focus groups, and that's across all of, all of uh, you know, the, I would say all the boroughs, but we don't really get into Staten Island quite as much as I think we could. So, you know, over most of the boroughs of Manhattan, we have existing community relationships that have been in place for you know, half a decade up to like 40 years. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of community ties that I get to draw on because there are existing relationships. I was just on a call this morning presenting to our community leadership council for the Allen Hospital and for Milstein. And that's talking to community leaders, understanding what are your needs, what are your challenges. As I'm, as I'm introducing the Dalio Center, what does success look like to you? So First of all, we have an a, you know, existent structure within the hospital that I get to draw from, very luckily. Mm -hmm. And then also, and I, I sort of alluded to this before, it's not just those leadership councils and the, the committees, it's also the community-based organizations. So it's those partnerships and the relationships that we have with CBOs. To make that the armory successful, our government community affairs, ambulatory care team, care network, they worked with over 70 community-based organizations. And when I say worked with, it wasn't just, oh, we're related, like, okay, call us if you need help. It was on the ground support of how mm -hmm. do we engage your community members? How do we get them scheduled for appointments into our center? How do we feed them through the process? How do you schedule them? How can we work 
with you to make it easier. So I think having that network of committees, of, of councils, of focus groups, of advisory groups, in addition to then having all of the network of CBOs really has lays a, a really rich foundation for us to be able to engage. And particularly around vaccine education, um, we have hosted, it's, I don't know the exact number anymore. It's, it's up there. I know we've reached over 10,000 people wow. uh, with our one-on-one -on -one Zooms. So this is that speakers bureau that was put in place. It's I think nine different languages at this point. We have slide decks and videos which we have developed in multiple different languages to really engage with the community. Um, and you know that's one on one time. So if you really think about community engagement, I myself have done, I don't know, I think 30 or 40 talks at this point. And that's for an hour, an hour or more, sometimes mm -hmm. two hours, just sitting with people and listening. And then saying, how can I support you in this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, at, at a large level, yes, it's great that we have all these networks and ties. And then on the one-to-one -one individual level, it's being present, opening your ears and just saying, I'm here to, I'm here to learn from you. Yeah. And, and I'll just add to that quickly, like there's, there's a philosophy that underlines that, right? There's mm -hmm. a belief about what should our relationship with community be? And it's, yeah. there's not one of sort of this paternalistic, I'm going to go and tell the community what they need yeah. to know. It's acknowledging that they already are, they're already empowered. They already know what they need. They already know what they want. They already know themselves better than anyone. Uh, how do we build a reciprocal relationship? And I think, you know, acknowledging that is, is so critical. It's not taking care of people. They, they're taking care of themselves. Yeah. And how do we work in partnership to, you know, enhance this for everyone? Can you say a little bit more about that? So how, how, give us an example of how you would do that in the work that you do or getting some of the messages out. Yeah, so if you think about, if I think about um, the, the, the VR work that, that I do, that, I, that I'm trying to do, and I'm going into uh, this mode of trying to create meaningful content. What do I think needs to be said? What stories do I need to be told? Um, there's a there's a healthy dose of humility that's necessary that acknowledges that I don't hold all the knowledge necessary to know what needs to be done here mm -hmm. or the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. So then I have to expand my view and say, who else should be at this table to help me plan and design and think about and problem solve? And not just like an add-on, you know, consultation ad advisory group, but people who are helping me think about this work from the ground from the ground up. Uh, I come from a very specific positionality and perspective, and I need other people's perspectives to really think about uh, the breadth of what it is that I'm trying to do. And I think that applies to all of our work. Um, we, can, we can see ways in which you know, institutions get frustrated that, oh, this group didn't show up. This group didn't come get the vaccine. This group didn't adhere to this thing that we said so we, was important. We heard a lot of that initially. Didn't Did we? you talk to them? Do, yeah. you, do you know what they want or need? Do they trust you at all? Like, should you be the one delivering the message at all? Or maybe you need to, you know, have a liaison because they don't trust you or your institution, right? And so you have to grapple with this. And again, there's, there's a dose of humility that comes along with that. Maybe I'm not the ultimate authority that I think I am mm -hmm. and hold all the knowledge cards that are necessary to get this done. Um, I think it's a, it's a shift in orientation that's, mm -hmm. that's important for us to all, you know, kind of hold. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I fully agree. And I think that it's, um, you know, bringing it back to my own work as a physician, just at the bedside. We all know, and this is how we train future doctors, is we talk mm -hmm. about that physician-patient relationship. Mm -hmm. How do you form a dyad? How do you share decision-making? Because I mm -hmm. can have in my head, well, I need you to take this blood pressure medication. And that's what, that's what I really- And that's what's best. So just do and that's this. what's best. And you need to do this and you got to do, it. but unless I engage you in the conversation, you may have very different ideas about your medical care. You may have different reasons for engaging in that, in, 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 in the medical, like in that encounter with me. And until we work together and until we share in the decision-making until I understand that you are, you are the owner 
of your own medical health, I am here to support you in helping make decisions. I am here to give you my expertise and my advice, but that doesn't mean that I know necessarily more than you do about your own body. We yeah. have to do this together. Right. And I think when we start to think about community engagement, a lot of times it's similar because we can identify, I look at maps all day long, where it's mm-hmm. just like we look at heat maps of what's going on in the city and I can identify places where we really need to work on smoking cessation or this is an issue for this neighborhood. So in my own you know, glass bubble, I could identify, okay, here's a gap. I'm going to close it. I'm going to develop a program and an initiative and not have it be informed by anyone who actually has this problem. Good, good luck with it. I know. <laughs> and then I could come in and say, here you go. Here's your solution. Here's your program. Yeah. But what I would miss is what's really driving what the ultimate, what the, whatever the outcome is that I've identified, what's driving that. And I will, I'll point you to um, one of my mentors, who's phenomenal, uh, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall. She mm-hmm. is just wonderful. Um, we were talking exactly about this and she said, and she, she told me a story about um, mm-hmm. there was a, a patient who, again, it's like, you gotta take your blood pressure medications. And yet every time the patient came in, it was, they're not taking their blood. I'm like, why can't, why are you taking your, I'm calling. I know they're available at the pharmacy. I know we've worried about the cost of them. We've tried to figure out all these things. And, and it's just like, you know, in your own head, you're trying to think through well, what are all the problems. And it wasn't until someone engaged the patient in the conversation that they learned that the bus line that they had to take to get to the pharmacy that you kept sending the prescriptions to wasn't safe. Mm. And so if we just sent them to a different pharmacy where the patient could go and was perfectly fine going there, mm-hmm. solve the problem. Now we're, not, now, now we're not talking about a patient who's non-compliant with care. We're talking about a shared decision. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really important to inform all of our strategies and the work we're doing because I can't decide for someone. I can help them make a decision. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we have time for, we had some questions come through the chat that I sort of put in with some of the questions that were already sent previously. Um, but I will open it up if we have uh, one or two questions. I'm seeing that some of them may come in through the chat now. There was a specific question while I'm waiting and looking about um, some of the tests that were done, particularly, I was just reading about pulse ox, for example, that it was more challenging to read uh, pulse ox on people of color with darker skin because that's not how the test was divided was uh, created. And then, you know, someone specifically was asking about the glomerular filtration rates that may be too specific for you and the work that you do, Julia. Oh, no, I can, so I can speak to that actually. Okay. I, think, um, I think it's important. And I, I think pulse oximetry and um, occult hypoxemia in patients with darker skin tones is a perfect example for how a system is designed looking to a quote unquote norm. And so when we are designing medical equipment with light skin as our norm, then we're not looking at the rest of the population. So, you know, this, uh, this question of, uh, so there's, there's two issues to unpack here. One is the systemic racism that's ingrained, like that is a, that's systemic racism when we think about that. Mm -hmm. The other is that that was identified years ago. Right. That was not new. It came right. up during COVID because there was so much hypoxia and we were very concerned and very like all eyes thinking about oxygenation. But there were studies decades ago, which, mm-hmm. which identified the issue with pulse oximetry. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a big issue because now we've identified that this is a problem and we said, we're not going to do anything about it. So I think that's where there's two components there, which we got to unpack. The first is how the system is designed. Mm -hmm. And then it's, what do we do when we identify the problems? And do we have the attention to really focus and say, we are going to work on this? Mm -hmm. It's that Institute of Medicine report from 20 Mm -hmm. years ago that said, this is a problem. And now we have to focus on it. So glomerular filtration rate, absolutely. Um, there was a race-based correction in it as a system. So as New York Presbyterian, we actually convened groups um, in 
now probably, I mean, almost a year ago now, um, across the organization with experts in all the fields, looking at all of our race-based corrections. And uh, as an organization, we actually do not use race as a correction for glomerular filtration rate. It was based on historical data, data <laughs> looking at the idea that muscle mass was greater in black patients than in white patients. Um, so, you know, I, there was a, if for people that want to know more about that, there's a really wonderful review in New England Journal, which goes through all of the potential race-based corrections. But mm -hmm. I think, again, it's where are you, where are you paying attention? Where are your eyes trained? And then what are you going to do about it? Because once you identify the problem, are you going to just live with it? Or are you going to try and, and, and fix it? And so we, we did. And I think that's a testament to when I said, like, what's different about things now? It's that we're identifying a problem and we're not just leaving it. We're saying, well, how are we actually going to fix it this time? Mm -hmm. How are we going to remain dedicated so that we can develop a solution? So I can already tell you there's some really invested um, so physicians who are quite passionate about the pulse oximeters and have really championed some of that work to try to, to say, what can we do about this? And that's across the country, people are doing that work. So Great, great. That's but great. ultimately there's, there's nothing about COVID that was surprising, right? Oh. And I think if anyone who feels shocked in this moment should take a step back and realize they shouldn't have been shocked, right? If we paid attention, if we read the paper from 20 years ago, we could have predicted all of this, that, mm -hmm. that you know, not the, not the particular pandemic and when it would happen, but who would be most gravely affected That's by it. it. Sure. We could have told you like a crystal ball, you know, well before it happened. Mm -hmm. And so we have to own that we, some of us were missing or ignoring critical pieces of information about health even in our commitment to health equity. So mm -hmm. more of us have to get on the, the same page about that. And hopefully at this point, when we're more aware that, that we won't lose sight of this moving forward. Because I'm gonna hold on to Julia's optimism. We're, we're on the right track. <laughs> we're on the right track. I have to, yes, we have to think that way. You know, yeah. because there's a generation coming behind me, my children, my grandchildren, great grandchildren, and yeah. this world gotta exist for them. Um, I want to thank you, uh, well, both of you. Sure. Excuse me. I see yeah, that back there. Oh, <laughs> so these are my my nieces and my nephew and my dad. And there's a picture of my mom and my these these two. I do this for because yeah. I have to leave a better world for these three little kids. Yeah, have to. And so yeah. I remain optimistic because I put photos all over my house and I say I'm going to do whatever I can to make I sure can. the world is a better place. For uh, exactly, exactly. And that's you know I'm just hoping that with the awareness, you know, we will act sooner and, and think about this is always gonna be at the forefront of any of the work that we do. And the questions are gonna be asked sooner than later and addressed. And we're gonna engage more of the community and people and, and really hear. And I think, you know, as we hear the marches and people marching and, and the conversations that, you know, I'm talking loud because I'm, I don't know anybody's listening. And, uh, and if you, you know, I keep talking louder, but are you really listening to me? So hopefully, you know, we are, listening and hearing and seeing and, and making change. So anyway, I want to thank you again, both of you, Dr. Courtney Cogburn, Dr. Julia Yashura, and uh, for tonight, for being our panelists for this evening, for the She Opened the Door uh, Health Equity and Justice uh, Thanks event. Thanks for having us, yeah. Thank you. And what the, this uh, pandemic has revealed to us and the hope for the future. Um, next, next on the Columbia at Home is the Creating a Powerful Brand by, uh, for Career Success with uh, Wendy Marks. And that's a program that's also done in collaboration with She Opened the Door. And that will be at 7 p.m. on April 28th. And you can register, you can register at alumni.columbia.edu. Thank you again, everyone. Be safe. Have a great evening and be well. Take care Thank of yourself. You. Good night. Good night.